Why do you remember some things, but forget other things? This is a central question within psychology, and the answer relies on knowledge of memory, emotion, focus, and the physical structures and the workings of the brain. When you know the answer of why we remember some things, you can study more effectively, communicate a message that people remember, and manipulate the way that you and the others see the world. This video will describe the cognitive load theory and how you can use it to teach, communicate, and share information like complex concepts. I'm also going to be going over how to use such a simple idea to be less stressed and more productive as you go out throughout your day. Teachers, designers, and even guys like me use principles of this theory every day, even if we don't know that we're using it. And once you understand this concept, you will find that your approach to learning and teaching is more intentional, strategic, and effective. But before continuing, I want to give a huge shout out to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. We'll talk more about them later. So cognitive load theory looks at the way that we consider working memory while teaching complex concepts or solving problems. And before we talk about this theory, we must talk about something called working memory. When you see something, hear something, or take in any type of information through your senses, it enters what psychologists call sensory memory. And from here, your brain quickly filters out information that is irrelevant. If you're intentionally devoting your focus to a video game, for example, the sound of the wind or the smell of your food cooking in the next room is forgotten. The information that is relevant goes into your working memory. Now, once the information is moved to your working memory, your brain begins to process it or decides to forget it. And the ultimate goal is to store the important information into your long-term memory. Psychologists believe that within long-term memory are structures of information, hierarchies. These structures are called schema, and they help you relate to individual pieces of information to other pieces of information. Within the schema of your video game, for example, you may have information about what each button on your controller does, or the backstory of a specific character. The first time you used your controller or played a game, information about each button was in your working memory. You rehearsed and worked with the information long enough that it's now in your long-term memory, and it's easy to retrieve every time you pick up the controller. But not all information that's important goes from your working memory ends up in your long-term memory. And why is that? In some cases, it's because you're overwhelming your working memory. And this is exactly what cognitive load theory is all about. So long-term memory is like a computer with unlimited data storage. Working memory, on the other hand, can only process a few pieces of information at a time. If we fail to come back to the information in our working memory, it'll be dropped. It'll be forgotten forever. Cognitive load theory suggests that if we want to learn more effectively, we must respect this reality and only load up a few pieces of information into our working memory at a time. If we load up on too much, we will be more likely to forget and won't connect information that we're trying to learn. Now, there's no set number when it comes to the pieces of information that can be held in our working memory. Our age and our development influence how much of a cognitive load that each person can take on at once. In general, the simpler the ideas are, the easier it will be to process them and store them in long-term memory. The creator of the cognitive load theory, John Sweller, also did a lot of work to describe the different types of cognitive load and how instructors can strategize their materials and lessons to lighten the load and help students learn more effectively. I'm going to go over these three types of cognitive loads in a little bit, but first let's learn how we can use the cognitive load theory in our own self-development. Did you know multitasking is a myth? You may be encouraged by your colleagues, managers, or society at large to get everything done at once and to save time. In reality though, multitasking does not save time. You cannot hold all the relevant information and multiple tasks in your working memory. When you switch back and forth between two different tasks or three different tasks, or sometimes more than five different tasks, your mind has to go through a mental shift, leaving behind some of the information from the previous task. Now these shifts take up more time and cognitive power than you might think. So a simple trick here is to reduce your cognitive load by focusing on only one task at a time. Put down your phone, turn off the TV, and give your brain less to work with. By doing this, the cognitive load is lighter. Once you're done with the task, you can more effectively put all of the relevant information aside and focus fully on the next task. The trick here is that you'll save time and reduce your chance of forgetting information as you shift back and forth. In fact, understanding cognitive load seems to help the most when we realize we can take advantage of it by not trying to tackle multiple projects at once. Now, I recently have been building a house to live in while also training a dog, working on this channel, and I basically found myself very stressed. And I think a lot of it is because I wasn't able to fully commit to each project. However, once I prioritized each project by itself and completed them one by one instead of all at the same time, I found each project much more enjoyable, and since then I've been feeling less stressed. 
Now, if you're interested in learning how to decrease your cognitive load, one of the best ways to do that is to come up with a morning routine. I recently took a course on Skillshare titled Morning Rituals, How to Create a Morning Routine. It outlines important routines that I found very helpful in making my mornings much more productive. Something new that I recently added was practicing gratitude, which seems really simple and cliche and is in all the books, but Philippa explained it in a new way that resonated with me and has actually been affecting my daily mood. With over 3,000 students in the course when I first saw it, I decided to go through it and I highly recommend this class. Skillshare actually sponsored this video, and if you don't know about them by now, they are an online learning platform with over 17,000 classes, and the price point is very affordable. One of these classes, in my opinion, is worth way more than the monthly fee that they charge. A premium membership costs less than $10 per month if you pay annually. It's a little bit more if you pay by the month, but still very affordable. And if you're interested, the first 1,000 people to click the link in the description below will actually get a free trial of Skillshare Premium. But back to cognitive load. So there are three types of cognitive load that may or may not be manipulated by teachers or instructors. And this is gonna get a little technical, so here we go. The first type is intrinsic cognitive load. This refers to the level of difficulty of information that someone is wanting to share. For example, the theory of cognitive load has a little bit more of an intrinsic cognitive load than say, a mathematical fact, like four times four equals 16. Now you need to know instructors and teachers can't manipulate the intrinsic cognitive load, but you should be aware of it whenever you're teaching something like this. Secondly, we have something called extrinsic cognitive load. And this is the method in which the information is taught to the students. So if it's really distracting or it's ineffective, these teaching methods increase extrinsic cognitive load. And the goal of teachers or mentors, whether they know it or not, is to reduce extrinsic cognitive load and communicate information in a simple, effective way. So as an example, let's look at two ways you can teach a simple fact. Christopher Columbus arrived in the Americas in 1492. So one of the ways to teach this information is to say, in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue, which a lot of people have heard, and you can just say it a few times throughout the day. Another way to teach this information is to show students a painting of Christopher Columbus sailing towards the Americas, holding some sort of decree or a scroll that says the year is 1492. Obviously, the first method is going to have a lot less cognitive load. It's easier to remember, and the information is already organized for our brain. There's a little rhyme to it. Students who learn this rhyme will commit it to long-term memory faster. It has a lower extrinsic cognitive load. Now, the third type of cognitive load is germane cognitive load. And this type of load occurs when we are creating a new schema for a concept. Schema, as I mentioned early in the video, are structures in which we organize and hold information. They provide context and make new information related to those schemas easier to remember. So let's say you enter a woodworking workshop with no prior knowledge of the craft. One instructor starts a workshop by introducing to you all the tools that you will use in woodworking. Now another teacher dives into a complicated project, asking you to grab tools that you're unfamiliar with. Grab this, grab that. The second teacher is increasing your cognitive load. You've got to play catch up as you attempt to build a more complicated schema with information that you do not already have in your long-term memory. It's kind of confusing and I'm not going to get too detailed in this video. But as you can see, the different types of cognitive load can be manipulated. And a smart teacher will keep these in mind as they choose materials and create a lesson plan. And ending this video, cognitive load theory feels like common sense, but in a world full of distractions, it's nice to remember every now and then, all you have to do is reduce your load to help you stay focused. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. I hope you learned something. And don't forget to check out Skillshare if you haven't already. Remember, the first thousand people to click the link in the description below will get a free trial of Skillshare Premium where you can check out all of their interesting and amazing classes. See you in the next video.